Canadian Arctic. Myself and about 100 other passengers are exploring the Northwest Passage with Cruise North Expeditions. Beginning with an Air Inuit flight from Montreal, we land in Resolute Bay, Nunavut, one of Canada's northernmost Inuit communities. In Resolute, we board our ship the Lubav Orlova and head south into Peel Sound. We are following the route of Arctic explorers before us, namely the British Sir John Franklin and the Norwegian explorer Roland Amundsen. And like those explorers, we find ourselves at the mercy of the sea ice by day three. Fortunately for us, the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, the Sir Wilfrid Laurier, comes to our rescue. And as we follow the icebreaker's stern lights well into the cold, foggy night, we spot a mother polar bear with cubs, slowly making their way over the sea ice. Within a few weeks, the colder temperatures will make it easier for the polar bears to travel and hunt for food. I can see now why the Inuit have so many words to describe the ice and snow. By day four, we arrived to the Inuit community of Johavan on Prince William Island. When Roald Amundsen pulled his boat, the Joe, ashore here in 1903, the Inuit were still nomadic. Amundsen wrote in his log, we thought the Eskimo were extinct and had been relegated to oblivion. But over the next two winters that Amundsen and his crew spent with the Inuit, they learned that wearing the skins of seal, caribou, and polar bear were far warmer and more comfortable than itchy woolens. The Inuit also taught them how to build igloos and how to travel easily over snowdrifts with dog teams. With this Arctic knowledge, Amundsen became the first explorer to successfully traverse the Northwest Passage. Today, Johavan is a thriving community of about 1,000 Inuit. The people still hunt seal, caribou, Arctic wolves, foxes, muskox, and polar bear. Instead of dog teams, they travel by snowmobile, like Paul Ekalak, who claims to be Amundsen's grandson. Paul is a member of the Canadian Rangers, a volunteer all-Inuit force who are the eyes and ears of the North. Paul says, I have been to the highest peak of Nunavut, and across the Arctic to Alaska on sovereignty patrol, all by snowmobile. The people of Johavan are clearly proud of their community and maintain their language of Anuktitut, as well as other Inuit traditions like this drum dance. Asked about signs of global warming, some of the Inuit elders report changes in the water and the fish seem to be more skinny. Grizzly bears as well as wolves and wolverines have been coming to this area for the last four or five years too, others add. Back on board ship, we head north making haste along the narrow route hugging the coast of the Boothia Peninsula should the ice close in on us again. The Canadian icebreaker is nowhere in sight, but our Russian crew steers us safely through the cold darkness. Meanwhile, the Cruise North Expedition staff has prepared a full series of lectures and some exciting shore excursions. Like in Liz, our onboard botanist Elizabeth Bradfield goes for belly botany. And on our first shore excursion at Fall Strait, we follow her on a short walk through a beautiful miniature landscape of lichen. Who would have known that lichen is not only a dye, but also a thickening agent, a component of perfume, of litmus paper, and most importantly, a food source for the caribou. Of course, we soon find ourselves on our bellies, getting up close and personal with lichens and bones. The long walkers, meanwhile, headed by expedition leader Shoshana Jacobs, are fortunate to spot a herd of shaggy muskox. Slowly 
making our way along Balat Strait to Fort Ross, we sight 11 polar bears, some nimbly climbing over the rocks, others diving and swimming in the icy waters to take a closer look at our ship. I just can't get over the colorful Arctic landscape, soon to be blanketed in white. At Fort Ross on Somerset Island, our onboard Inuit guides, Jason, Jenna, May, and Bella, accompany us to see the remains of an old Hudson's Bay Company post and house. We also come across a rock cairn and plaque documenting the historic significance of this site. Though it has been more than 60 years since these buildings were occupied, it feels like they were just abandoned yesterday. Inuit caribou hunters still use the island to take shelter in severe Arctic storms. And I'm sure there are ghosts of the past, whether they be explorers, whalers, or Inuit hunters that forever wander this cold landscape. Dinner that evening is suddenly interrupted by the cry of whales. We all stampede to the decks to watch more than 12 orcas pass in front of our ship, their large dorsal fins disappearing in the calm twilight waters. Shore excursions to Furry Beach and the next day to Beachy Island reveal even more surprises. Massive polar bear tracks followed by smaller ones of an arctic fox line the beach a scenic river gorge carved from shale cliffs rising up behind. It is a treasure trove of fossils, and also where Captain William Perry left a life-saving food cache when his ship, the HMS Fury, was driven ashore by ice in 1825. On Beachy Island, we find the lonely graves of some of Franklin's men, as well as the remains of Northumberland House a supply depot for searchers of the ill-fated Franklin Expedition. Back in Resolute Bay, I reflect on the exciting days that have just passed. The birds we saw with Ken Knowles, the Franklin presentation by Nadine and Jean-Claude Forestier, the Inuit games we played with Jenna, and last but not least, when May led the passengers in Inuit throat singing all of us sounding a little like grumpy walruses with laryngitis. But boy, did we have rhythm. <laughs> 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 